Hi everybody, welcome to episode 14 of Satellite 664. I'm uh, one of your two co-hosts, Kaz Tagian, and, and as always I'm joined by Steve Loopy Newhouse. Hello everybody, how we doing? Good, oh, good, oh, how's your day been mate? Um, you don't want to talk about my restless legs. No, we don't want to talk about that. Other than that, everything is fine. Restless leg syndrome, maybe we should do an episode on restless leg syndrome. No, it's not. No, I've been awake. My legs will keep me awake all night thinking about it. <laughs> so, just now we've just started recording, and um, literally ten minutes ago, the announcement came on the uh, the official Iron Maiden website that the four scheduled German shows have now been postponed, um, and they are Bremen, Cologne. Stuttgart and Berlin. Berlin. So that's an interesting um, development because uh, they they are basically telling people to hold on to their tickets for the uh, shows that will be rescheduled, which effectively tells you that the Legacy of the Beast tour will be uh, pretty much dragged into 2021. So yeah, I mean... You think about the countries that, um, that Germany borders, uh, Poland, that's, that's got to go. Uh, da, 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 Belgium, I mean, well, that's been cancelled anyway. Let's not forget um, Italy. Let's not forget Italy. Which, yeah, which is, Italy. I mean, Austria's already gone. Which is incredibly um, still officially on sale. and like no Switzerland, France. Sooner or later, I mean, it's, it's all going to go. I mean, this is at the moment. This is pure speculation, but I can't see this tour going ahead at all in any shape, form, or fashion. What do you mean? You mean, as in, you don't believe? I, 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 it, I'm not going to say the whole thing is going to be cancelled. It's going to be rescheduled, the same as they're doing with the Germans, German ones. Yeah. Well, the point being that. 20, Even if they push it back a year, you know, 2021 will be a <coughs> Legacy of the Beast tour in its fourth calendar year, basically. Um, yeah. Which um, means that the this fabled, mythical new album will be kicked kicked down the road a little bit longer, unfortunately. So let's just see. Uh, there's, there's nothing you can do about it. No. Money making machine. That's right. Want to get out of it, so. That's right. Contracts. It's contracts. Yeah. Big, big, big dollars, big business, and um, I think that's uh, that's going to win out in this instance. But anyway, let's. Um, so what we're going to do to cheer ourselves up, Kaz? Oh, uh, let me have a think. Can I just have some thinking time? Is that enough? Uh, how about how about we invite a special guest? Like um, who? You know what? I'm feeling a little nostalgic myself tonight. I, I, why don't, why don't we go back to the '90s? Let me go back to the the mid '90s, and and why don't, why don't we get someone on the show that um, had something to do with Iron Maiden? What is somebody who was there? Yes. Ooh. Interesting. Who? I said interesting. Oh, interesting. Let's do that. Let's let's bring somebody who is much loved, somebody who has a fascinating story to tell, and somebody who's going to shed a lot of light on a lot of different issues onto the show. So, to our friends, grab a coffee, get some marshmallows, sit back, relax, and enjoy the interview with... Mr. Blaze Bailey. Yeah. Everybody, we have uh, the pleasure of being joined by none other than Mr. Blaze Bailey. Um, Blaze, welcome to Satellite 664. Uh, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me on your show. You're welcome, Blaze. Good to see you, mate. Um, I'll start off with a very simple question. How are you coping with the lockdown, and what do you do with yourself? Well, I'm very, apart from publicity? very resentful 
about the government because I had to be at home anyway working on my new songs and my book. So I was already staying in and then they say, you've got to stay in and work at home. Well, I was doing that anyway. So don't <laughs> tell me to do what I was already doing. <laughs> so I'm absolutely fed up with the bloody government. I already decided this was in my schedule. Stay at home, write my book, don't go out, make sure I get my work done, make sure I write my song. Oh no, oh you've got to work at home. I was already working at home. Yeah, I know the feeling, mate. I know the feeling. I'm resentful of these instructions that have told me to do what I'm already doing. You're you're frustrated. Lucky that I've got a house with a back garden, and I just my heart goes out to people who are living in apartments and flats and are having to stay in bed seats and one room places. Man, that's just those are the people that have got the real challenge. Yeah, after I live in a tower, but no balcony. Yeah, I, I'm lucky. I share a I share a house with someone, and we have a back garden, and nice. I've got room for my equipment and everything, so I can work properly. But people who are stuck in flats and apartments, I really, really feel for those guys at the moment. So I think they're the ones with the real challenges, and uh, I hope that everybody will get through it. Okay. Mm. Fingers crossed, yeah. We can only hope, Blaze, your frustration is palpable and certainly uh, mirrors and reflects those of all of us, really, and it's, it's a, such an unprecedented time. <clears throat> so, Blaze, are you you're originally from Tamworth in the West Midlands. Are you, do you still live there? No, I was born in Birmingham and I moved to Tamworth uh, in my teenage years and that's where I... <laughs> got together with the guys from Wolfsbane, from uh, the first serious band that I was involved with. We were very, very lucky in Tamworth that there was a newspaper called the Tamworth Herald, which had a great music page. And I saw a little advert on that music page, which said, heavy metal singer required no experience necessary. <laughs> and that was mixed Brilliant. perfectly. And <laughs> we got together and we were just so horrible that we couldn't play any covers because people would see how bad we were. So we wrote 10 original songs and uh, did our first small shows. And that was how we started, really. And just by staying together, and, you know, playing music that we created ourselves is, is how we really got somewhere. And um, years later, we got a record deal with an American company. I don't know how. And then years after that, we were chosen to support the guys in Maiden on a kind of anniversary tour that they were doing all of the theatres that they played around the time of Number of the Beast tour going on, then uh, they played all those places again. 33 shows in the UK sold out. And that was a no nice. prayer for the dying tour. And as Wolfsbane, we were lucky enough to be selected for that tour, and it was fantastic. Years later when they were looking for a replacement for Bruce, I was able to get an audition alongside hundreds of other applicants. I was lucky to be one of the 12 people that actually auditioned for Iron Maiden. I never thought for a moment that I would get it because my voice is so different to Bruce Dickinson. But I think after all of the years with Bruce that perhaps they wanted a change from that voice. And I think that went well for me. And so I was so lucky to be offered the job 
as the lead singer of Iron Maiden. I mean, it's an incredible, life-changing moment for me. And when I joined, Steve Harris said, there is no music written for the next album. Whoever comes up with the music, I don't care. As long as it's great songs and great music, that's what we need. And so it was an open book, really. And I worked with Yannick Gers and with Steve Harris. And we came up with, in my opinion, a lot of great music. And it really shows the start of that progressive era of Iron Maiden. And it was a, a roller coaster ride, you know, working with these incredible people, learning so much from Steve Harris and the guys with so much experience, and also thousands of interviews. And it was an incredible five years, really. It's 25 years ago now, but some of that music still lives on, and it has a great place in my heart. So it's something, an experience that I treasure and I value. And you can see with the work that they've done since, it's just got better and better since then. So it was obviously a break creatively, a different thing that they, they've benefited from having that time apart, Bruce and Maiden, because now they're doing just some incredible, incredible work. And it's given me this wonderful opportunity to have a solo career. And I've done 11 albums, in uh, studio albums of my own work, and now I'm a completely independent solo artist. So I am funded 100% by fans. So people that visit my web shop at blazebailey.net and buy CDs and T-shirts, they are the people that make it possible for me to make my next CDs and to live my life as an artist. And I'm incredibly, incredibly lucky to be able to do that. I am actually living my dream, as humble as it may be, or it may seem for some people. I'm living my dream right now that I started off with 30-something years ago when I saw Ronnie James Dio sing at Birmingham Odeon. He sang Children of the Sea from his Black Sabbath days. I'd never heard that song before. But it cast a spell on me. It was an epiphany, a pivotal moment in my life. And after that moment, I was never the same. After that moment, I wanted to be a heavy metal singer and tour the world. And I'm so lucky I've been able to achieve my dream. And I'm still living my dream right now. Amazing. I mean, even, even as a solo artist, I mean, you're still traveling the world. Or up until recently? Up until February, really. Yeah. Um, I think our last gig was Burfest in March, I think. Start of March was Burfest. Yeah, Dad, how was Burfest? It was fantastic. It was unbelievable. Because what I'm doing is an anniversary set to say, well, it's 25 years ago. People come to my gigs and say, the last time I saw you was 1996. I said, Alma, well, I've done 11 albums and two of them. <laughs> and that's all I've done. I've done nothing. And no one knew what I'm like, oh, so I thought, right, this is what I'm going to do. So many people asked me for different Maiden songs. I thought, this is the time. It's a positive anniversary because it's joining I am Maiden. And that was such a positive thing for me. It's not an anniversary of leaving. It's an anniversary of joining. So I do a special anniversary set list, which is mostly songs from X Factor and Virtual Eleven, my own versions and interpretations of those songs. 
And that's what we did at Burfest. And it was the first time that we did it in the UK. And the reaction, man, it was unbelievable. Unreal yeah. reaction that we I mean, had. As, 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 soon as, as soon as Andy put your name to that, I mean, that, that's basically what sold the show out. People wanted to see Blaze yeah. Bailey do Iron Maiden. And I, I think we were so lucky because it was right on the edge of the virus. And I thought it, they'd already, in France, they'd already stopped. They limited shows to 500 people already in France. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, is this going to go, man? Is this show? But we were lucky. It was one of the last concerts before the new regulations and the new rules came in. So we were so lucky to do that. And it was, of course, it was just fantastic. We had just a great response. So I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Fantastic. <clears throat> Blaze, <clears throat> Blaz, I just want to briefly touch on the X Factor era. You said something very interesting before that it was, uh, uh, it was like a herald, herald, herald that a progressive uh, phase in the band's history. Uh, Steve Harris actually is quoted as saying that he considers X Factor almost as an extension of the Seven Son of a Seven Son album. Now, that album d did particularly well in the United States, and it almost revitalized Maiden's career, um, whereas it didn't do as well at home in the UK. What, do you think there's a... What's your opinion or what's your view of the reason why that, that the X Factor did well, very well? Very, I think it's two things. One is the girlfriend syndrome, and that is your favorite singer has left your favorite band. You don't want the new version. Just like when your girlfriend leaves you and you see her with another guy, you don't want to know about it. Okay that she left, but not okay that she found somebody else who may be slimmer, taller, and have more hair. So you don't want that. <laughs> Uh, so that was one reason it's like I think a lot of fans found it difficult to adjust and the other reason is that the British rock press, the, particularly the metal press at that time had the knives out for Maiden, they really wanted to finish Maiden they were saying Maiden isn't relevant they're so old they should just give up and all absolutely vile, horrible things they were saying in the British press while we were on tour playing to 10,000 people a night in other countries around Europe. And when we came back and played Brixton Academy, the reaction from the fans was incredible, phenomenal. So those evil press people could have no power over most of the hardcore Maiden fans. But they did, I think, stop a lot of new people getting interested in Iron Maiden. And that's why. That, that's, that's what happened. And there is a song. It's on my live album. It's called Virus. It's originally on the Best of the Beast album. And when I was in Maiden, we wrote that song specifically about that horrible, cynical attitude of the British press. Build you up, and then they feel they have the right to knock you down. Well, excuse me, but you've got nothing to do with building up Iron Maiden, because that was done by fans and great music. And you're not going to knock Iron Maiden down, because it's a fan's band with great music. So it was so frustrating for those people to be completely and utterly powerless over Iron Maiden. And of course, in the end, what happens? Because Iron Maiden won't go away, because fans love the band the way that Queen fans love Queen and Kiss fans love Kiss, then the journalists go, oh, maybe Iron Maiden's okay then. <laughs> Yeah, you've actually, you've actually, <laughs> Blaze, you've actually touched on um, uh, something which I wanted to talk to you about, and and that is, what was it like in 1995, 96, uh, playing in a, a a band 
which was really a goliath of 80s metal, but in an era of grunge and industrial bleak, that sort of bleak industrial music. Oh man, you, you just, that, that's another part of this story. And not many people remember that and not many people address that. I live through it. Good, a good question because we, <laughs> we were in Seattle in must look like in probably one of the shittiest places that Iron Maiden had played since they were touring in a van, you know. And there we were in the heart of the world, of the heart of grunge, the heart, the homeland of grunge. There we were, Iron Maiden playing in this fucking what is a shithole, and. Um, <laughs> Horrible. It was absolutely horrible. In many places that we that we went, people looked at us funny, as if we were some kind of dinosaur or anachronism, uh, 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 something like that at that time. But in other places that we went, we were like uh, uh, the relief. It's like thank God that made it us still metal. Oh, that we don't have to put up with these shoe watchers anymore, <laughs> with these suicidal, miserable oaths. <laughs> shoe watchers. <laughs> we can still have made and we can still escape, we can still live for power and feeling good. We don't have to feel miserable. And uh, that was what was happening. And in different places, there were different reactions. But in the world at large of music, our tiny little part of our reality of heavy metal music, that, that was out there, man. <clears throat> and what, one of the most disgusting and troublesome things for me was seeing Dick <laughs> Leopard cut their hair <laughs> to a style that they thought may appeal to grunge people you deaf leopard, you poured sugar on me. You rock, you rock stars. You rock grunge, you never will be. Stand your car with a smaller hand and, start, and keep pouring sugar on me and keep animalizing me. Don't become grunge. And we've had to weather that storm. Yeah. You know, all of us. And I was in the thick of that, man. In the thick of this horrible grunge era. Playing heavy metal, uncompromising heavy metal as well, because uh, what Steve Harris said was, "We do what we do. We don't give a fuck what else is going on. We do what we do. We're Iron Maiden. We do what we do. We play what we feel. It comes from the heart and it's played with passion. That's what Maiden is. And man, that's a huge relief because you're not trying to be fashionable. You're just trying to be yourself." And obviously, I was a huge Maiden fan before I joined Maiden. So I had that in my heart. And to actually be there in Maiden and know that they refused to give a fuck what anybody else was doing was an incredible yeah. feeling and yeah. experience. So it's, that, was, that was great. But, yeah, we were there in the thick of it. Of course, we took the slatings. We we were we were rubbished, we were derided for what we did. Twenty-five years later, what's grunge? It's nothing. We it's all know dead. what heavy metal is. <laughs> Absolutely. Blaze, the, the X Factor is um, well known as a very dark, reflective, okay. int introspective album. There's a couple of songs which you um, co wrote that I'm really interested in um, asking you about. Could you take me through 2AM? Tell me about how that song came about because it's got some very strong themes of hopelessness, helplessness. Uh, how did that song actually come about and what is it about? Well, one of the things I've learned as a, a writer over the years is never throw anything away. Keep all your ideas in, note, in a notepad now or keep them on my phone or whatever. Always keep your ideas. So we had this little bit of music and 
it's made me think of this time when things weren't going well for me in Wolf Spain and perhaps it was time to think is the dream over will we ever get anywhere and I got home at 2am and turned on the TV at that time only four channels and opened a can of warm weak beer and felt very sorry for myself and thought perhaps my dream of being a singer of touring the world of performing and writing perhaps that's over perhaps this is my life now perhaps my dream is dead and i have to accept that this is my life and those lyrics i started to think about I thought, hang on i think i might have something for this music and i found the lyrics and of course they're very simple they're self-explanatory but it's a completely true story about my situation and of course it is true for millions of people that go to work just for the money there are millions of us that i'm one of them that have had to do jobs just to keep my family going just to pay bills there are millions of us that work jobs we hate that we only go to because we have to have the money mm. to live and survive and that's what that song is about i'm incredibly lucky to have the life that i have to be able to live as an artist as a full time artist a heavy metal singer and songwriter i'm incredibly lucky and that song 2am often crops up in my unplugged set and my acoustic set and it's something that a lot of people come to me and say i felt this exact exact feeling and that people have identified with and the spooky thing is that perhaps i don't know how it works but we feel this come back at us we feel this mirror our lives and perhaps because someone else has experienced that and been through that perhaps then we can say well if they did it and they're there now perhaps i can get through it too wow incredible incredible um Blaze, uh, the other thing I wanted, to, the X Factor 95-96 took you to some very uh, sort of new places uh, amongst uh, like Jerusalem, South Africa. There's one particular, quite peculiar incident though. The band was due to play in Beirut in Lebanon and at that 11th hour, the Lebanese government withdrew um, the visas and and um, the, the, the British consulate was sort of powerless to get them back. What was what happened there? What was the story that's behind? That's just a normal situation for that part of the world. You know that that's just normal at that time. I think it's I think it's very tough now, but at that time you couldn't <coughs> play both places. If you were confirmed in Israel, you couldn't go to Beirut, and if you were confirmed there, you couldn't go to Israel. It was just that was the politics of the area of the region at that time it's nothing to do with music that's just the way it was i don't think badly of anybody because of that you know we were looking forward to going to both places but you couldn't do both places on the same tour oh. that was just impossible for anybody i think except what i think maybe one or two death metal bands were able to do that uh, and, and go kind of under the political radar. But for Iron Maiden, it, it was impossible. But, you know, it was an incredible experience to sing Number of the Beast in Bethlehem. That was something I'll never forget. I will stay with me. That was just incredible. And 
what was great for me on that tour was it was the first time that Maiden, not just me, but that Maiden had been to many of those places. And that was a really nice feeling that it was new for everybody. And uh, it felt good, man. It was, there was a, it was a very, very tough tour, a lot of shows, but what made it worse was in a lot of places that we played, it was winter. And as we kind of went around the world and did our tour, we were playing in the winter of every country. <laughs> That's okay. When you're in Brazil, it's okay because the winter's just not that bad. And, uh, but everywhere else, man, it was very, very tough. It was like an endless winter. But it was, yeah. I mean, it was a fantastic experience. It wasn't all, no, it, it was incredible. But it was a very tough tour. And I, I remember Dave Murray saying, this is the toughest tour I've ever done. Wow. And, I, and I looked at him, I thought, you've done world slavery. <laughs> if this, if this, is, this must be really tough then, if this is the toughest tour. <laughs> yeah, we don't notice now that uh, they tend to follow the sun. But like wherever they play now, it's yeah. always sunny. And, yeah, they tour, doff. <laughs> I was in, we, we played New York and there was a snowstorm and they said, oh, the show might be cancelled. But fans turned up through the snow, through a, a, a snowstorm, sold out the theatre. Everything went well. We went down to Florida, beautiful sunshine, daytime to bike week, no day off. <laughs> and then we are I'm in real. New York with two <laughs> days off in a bloody snowstorm in the middle of winter. Brilliant. Brilliant. Right, after, um, after Maiden... How long did it take you to realise you were becoming successful, like solo? Uh, well, I think we all have different ideas and measurements of what success is. For some people, it's selling a lot of records and making a lot of money. For me, it is singing and being able to tour and make records. And I have a very humble life. That's why I can do what I do and keep doing that. So what I what I did after Maiden was I made a plan and I'd always been in a band. So my gut reaction was I'm gonna get a band together. And I didn't feel I could go back because I learned so much with Maiden and I loved working with the two guitars and the different things that you could do with that. And I learned so much about songwriting from Steve Harris and that style. And I really wanted to do my own thing. As well as that, I had on my dictaphone at the time quite a few ideas that I really thought would be on the next Maiden album, that I thought I would be on a third Maiden album. I had no idea that Bruce would come back at that time. So I thought, well, actually, I've written songs with the guys. They've been good enough for Maiden albums. I feel pretty confident about these songs. And that was Silicon Messiah. Okay. Like, four of the ideas on Silicon Messiah were ideas that I was hoping to work on with Steve Harris and Dave Murray and Yannick Gers. So they ended up being songs of my own on the Silicon Messiah album. So for me, success was getting a band together and getting an album out and trying to get out there. But it, to be Which, honest, it was a very rough road. I mean, that's, that's a nice segue into the next question. Now. I mean, basically, you've got a new live album and DVD. So tell us a bit about it. Well, it has some of my Maiden Era songs on. Yeah, I'll notice this four, four tracks. My yeah. own interpretation of Virus, which is a song that we did for the Best of the Beast album. I've done my own version of that, my own interpretation of it. And I think that this is the best version of that that I've recorded on Live in Check. And also the biggest achievement of my solo career 
is my trilogy. The Infinite Entanglement trilogy is three albums that tells one story about a man who does not know at the beginning if he is human. And really the live in Czech DVD and the live album, it brings all of this together, my past with Maiden and my trilogy and some of the songs from my solo career. And we kind of choose what we think is the best. And it's something that I wanted to do for a long time is at the end of each tour, get a really good live recording. So that if you saw that tour, then you have, oh yeah, that's the set list that I saw. That's what I remember from that tour. And I'm very, very lucky. I have a great manager who's very supportive of me as an artist and my artistic vision. <coughs> and um, I was able to do that. So it's a very small, intimate venue. There's no barrier between me and the crowd. We're very, very close. There are fans there that have supported me for years going back to the Little Stango. And it was a magical, magical two evenings that we had. Also, not forgetting, Blaze, you've got a really good band behind you. I mean, I've listened to the album a few times now. And the more I listen to it, the heavier it gets. Was, was, was that your intention, to make like the, the ultimate heavy album? Well, I don't say too many nice things about the band because I start asking for more money. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, right. I, I mean, I, I'm very, very lucky. The guys just, I don't have a full-time band. They're called Absolver. They're a band yes, in their yeah. own right. And they come and make music with me. They record for me and work <clears throat> work on my tours. And I'm very, very lucky to have those guys. They're so patient, as well as being hugely talented they're incredibly patient because I'm such an arsehole. I just, I'm the worst person to work with. I'm an arsehole. I don't have a great memory. So if I haven't insulted you, I probably can't remember and I'll insult you again. And so <laughs> I'm a difficult person to work with in the studio and, and sometimes on tour as well. I'm moody, I get miserable. You know, I'm awful. But these guys put up with me and they work their hearts out. And the amazing thing is that they are there for the fans. For them, for all of us, the most important part of the gig is the fans. And making sure that we do our best as a band, not just as guys backing me as a singer, but as a band that we play together to give something truly memorable and special to the fans that make it possible for us to yeah, make it. It, it, it works a treat. It works a treat. It sounds fantastic. Go, go back to what you said about touring. <coughs> How, how do you, well, I can't really say how you do that these days, but do you sort of travel by tour bus, minibus, cars? How no, do you do it these days? I'm, it's, I'm so small. I'm like tiny, tiny. So you talk your motorbike? I'm very, very <laughs> small. And that's how I am able to do what I do. You know, it's totally unpretentious. There is no rock starism about touring with me because what is the single most important thing to me singing i love to sing what's next the people that support me so everything i do is based around that so why do i need a tour bus i've toured by bus before yeah it's nice sometimes to to have your own bunk 
a lot of times it's just a waste of time. I play in small, intimate venues. Normally, 500 to 1,000 people is the biggest show that I play. I'm not trying to get big. What I'm trying to do is go back to the old school when I saw Maiden, Twisted Sister, when I saw Metallica for the first time, when I saw all those bands that were in theatres. And if it's sold out, they added another night. And that's what I want to do. That's what I'm, uh, I am managing to do with great support from my manager and my band. If we do well, I don't move up to a bigger venue. I play another night at that venue, another intimate gig with a couple of different songs, just the way that the bands used to do before arenas, before yeah. stadiums. We saw bands with 3,000 people, 1,500 people. There we were in these rooms experiencing, feeling mm. heavy metal, feeling the power of the music. Mm. And that's where I am. That's Jeez. where my music comes to life. I love playing big festivals. I did Sweden Rock. It was absolutely huge. I've done Wacken three times. It's incredible. But where I live is in these intimate venues and independently owned, most of them as well. No bullshit about hall charges. Oh, but we've got about 25% of your T-shirt money. What? No. <laughs> Which is is every arena, every <laughs> single arena and stadium charges you that. When you buy a Maiden T-shirt, 25% of what you pay, Maiden doesn't get that. The arena gets that. And they're not even allowed to sell the merchandise themselves. So those hall charges and that business, I hate business, music business, I hate it. So I'm in the, mu I'm in the business of music. Yeah. I'm not yeah. in the music business. Yeah. You're a musician's musician, basically. In fact, I actually well, found a quote. It's so nice that you describe mm. me as a musician. That's lovely. I actually found a, found a quote, I think I actually found it on your website, which said that you are the ultimate front man. Well, that's great. I didn't write that myself, I can tell you. That. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't write that myself. I wish I had. <laughs> I wish I had. That's a great <laughs> Blaze, the new album uh, Live in Czech has a very striking artwork, and and it's 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 very very attractive, very appealing to look at. Um, now I, I believe the the artist is Accurant Illustration, um, yeah. who also interestingly enough has done the Legacy of the Beast tour artwork for the or the promo posters for Iron uh, for Iron Maiden. That's a very interesting crossover. How did you end up working with him? Well I discovered him well I didn't discover him, obviously he existed before. Oh. But he started to do a bit of work for me and at the same time he started to do <coughs> some work for Maiden and he came on board with the trilogy and helped me with the artwork for that because I needed something to keep those three albums together. And it had been started by another wonderful artist in Sweden. And um, he, I mean, I'm so lucky. He actually had been listening to my solo albums and my solo work, and he really enjoyed it. So when I got in touch with him, um, it was great, really, to to have that together, to to be able to work with him on that. And what I wanted with the live album, obviously, it, it's kind of a, a bookmark, a, just a something that signifies the end of the trilogy and the touring mm. that is predominantly the songs from my Infinite Entanglement trilogy. And I wanted that to be the feature of the Live in Czech artwork. And we've had many, many compliments about this artwork and the work. Oh, God, three great covers. Three great Thank covers. Thank you very much. It's yeah. down to him. We do work closely with Skype and uh, and it's the most, most bizarre thing that I don't speak Spanish and 
Acuron, credit to, he speaks a bit of English. And then type, things, ideas don't go over so well, and, and we're trying to type to each other. I go, no, not like this. So then I go, right, we'll Skype. Okay, we'll Skype. And, and we're Skyping, uh, and I'm going, no, it's not, I don't want the character to look like that. And then I find, and this is the most bizarre thing, I shouldn't even say it out loud, I find that I'm holding up a Barbie doll, an old one, right, <laughs> saying, like this, this, that, like this, doing this. And he's going, okay, now I understand. And then we are two players playing with Barbie dolls, right, and not even new ones. But an old one that I found somewhere lying around. At your age. Right. So, At your age. Right. Yeah, so, so you've got we've got this great artwork, but the start of it was, no, not like that. Like this doll that I'm holding up right now. <laughs> No, the the common thread really, um, right from your first album, Silicon Messiah, to the present live in check, the artwork really throughout all the albums is very striking and um, quite attractive. I think it complements the music very well as well. Well, it's a it's a concept and it is my greatest achievement in my musical career that's what I feel and it is a story it started as a science fiction story and I had an album to write and I had a deadline to meet and I had no lyrics really mm. and I started looking through at what I did have and it was all notes for my book which is a science fiction story that I'm writing and I started to try some of these ideas and some of the notes and some of the parts of the book that I'd written, and it started to work. And so suddenly, it was obvious this was a concept album. And then further down the line, it became obvious, and this was the scary part, it was three albums telling one story. And I didn't want to say it to anybody, but, you know... Uh, Somebody said, well, how many songs have you got? I said, we've got 16. And they said, well, you've only got time and money to record 10. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. And actually, I'm not finished at 16. So then, he was, <laughs> well, it's not one album, is it? Right. And so that was it. And I was so lucky, you know, the, to uh, the guys in the band, um, my manager, I said, well... Actually, it's three albums. And I go, oh, okay. They didn't say, well, it can't be done. If I was on a label in the mainstream, they would say, make the first one, we'll see how it does. But because I'm independent and because I'm supported by fans, I was able to ask my fans to pre-order that album and and pre-order the next one as well as that I had incredible help from Rob Anna's studio in Birmingham England and it just in just Robert Hoffman who runs that studio it, it's an incredible incredible human being and a huge fan of music and he said to me well you can use the studio and just pay me when you have the money. So I, did, I, I was able to then start recording my second album. So the whole thing, I've been incredibly lucky. I've had so much help from everybody to enable me to do this Infinite Entanglement trilogy. And now coming to Live in Czech, where you can feel the big songs coming to life and the real emotion and the songs have settled down since the studio uh, um, you know I'm over the moon with it yeah so you should but it's a great yeah. album yeah credit to you Blaze it's um it's thank it's you incredible. I'm very lucky oh. I had a lot of help a lot of help okay great really look forward to uh, chatting with you for quite some time it is mm -hmm. your involvement with Maiden really was in a in a fascinating era 
and in hindsight, a very important era of the band because it really was the conduit between, you know, the classic era from 1980 to 1992 and this sort of post-reunion renaissance. It's an extremely fascinating, it's a pivotal time of the band's history and it's one that's cherished by a lot of people because that 1994 to 1999 era actually a lot of new generation well, a new generation of fans came came on board and discovered the band and you, you know timeline is everything and a lot of those fans will say that X Factor and Virtual 11 are the best two maiden albums and that's their favorite yeah. album yeah. you know yeah. so it's a credit to you and um, you know you you certainly are a very highly respected and well loved member of the maiden fraternity so loopy do you do you have anything else? We could talk all day, but do you no, have any- Yeah, we probably could, but... Uh... Good, good luck with your show. If you would mention my website... Yes. Yeah. net. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, I've, I've got it all written down, Blaze. My official Facebook, that would be absolutely great. I'm completely funded by fans, and I'm promoted by fans as well, so... That would yeah. be great if you could help me with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. lovely talking Not to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, mate. Cheers, Blaze. Uh, hopefully get to talk to you again when Absolutely. my new studio album comes out. Blaze, the studio album. Blaze, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being so generous with your time and um, chatting to us. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah. And uh, all the best to you, mate. We hope Live in Check absolutely breaks a ceiling and um, does well for you and we'll support you any way we can. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Thank Take you. care. Thanks. Stay safe. Thanks for the love, Blaze. Stay safe, Blaze. Take care, mate. See you later. Right. Ah, awesome. What a chat. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, most, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I can't believe that uh, that went as well as it did. Uh, right, for people that, uh, that are interested... Uh, you can contact Blaze on blazebailey.net or alternatively, you can go to Facebook um, and it's at official Blaze Bailey. Uh, information on the album, uh, the album package, uh, is uh, double album, double DVD. Uh, package one is just the double album. Package two is the double DVD. Package three is the double CD and the double DVD. And the package four is what they like to call the, the ultimate package, which is the double DVD, double CD. There's a, a custom patch, a custom guitar plectrum. There's a custom, uh, no, there's not another custom USB stick. There's a USB stick, uh, which has the HD versions of the DVDs. And the other part was uh, exclusive membership to a Facebook page called uh, Circle Live Burno, which is B-R-N-O. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, the other thing I would like to do is thank uh, Mark Appleton for setting this up. Absolutely. Yeah, the whole thing has just been brilliant. Absolutely, yeah. Mark Mark Appleton is uh, Blazer's manager. He's been so helpful, so accommodating, so kind. And um, yeah, thank you, Mark. Thanks for thanks for making this happen because yeah, we absolutely. yeah we had so much fun i think of all of the all the episodes we've done so far and we and we love making the show we love making yeah, all we yeah, love the making all, in the post <laughs> we love <laughs> look we love making all these episodes but th- this was a lot of fun this was a uh, tremendous fun and thanks yes, Mark. absolutely yeah. and, and thanks plays again okay it's late i'm really tired i want to go to bed it's time to go until the next episode take care everyone and when you when you finish, go back and start again. You'll enjoy it. It's great. Absolutely. See you guys. See ya. Bye.